voice of the customer often gets lost in all the other things that we, uh, all the navel gazing that we tend to do uh, as an industry. And uh, us ourselves, our customers, just like you guys uh, are as well. And so, um, just want to take an opportunity to talk a little bit about the trends that we're seeing uh, on our global passenger survey, and uh, then talk a little bit at the end in terms of what one ID is one of the initiatives that we've uh, identified uh, to help improve our lot in life for our customers. So. The survey itself, so it is one of the most comprehensive, if not the most comprehensive passenger survey uh, that we, we utilize in the industry. Uh, the demographics are illustrated there, 60% uh, male, 38% uh, on the female side, two non-declared. Uh, we do it at regional balance based on, on, uh, on size of the market. And uh, as you can see, the disbursement in terms of the age uh, we collect this data from uh, uh, from the mid of April to around about the end of June. We conduct it in 14 different languages, and we utilize this information not only to uh, to, to uh, identify, to, as I said, be a voice of our customer, but we also utilize this to guide our work in terms of passenger experience uh, within within IATA and on on my team. So, what's our goal? Our vision really relies upon a happy passenger. And when you look at these numbers, uh, you can see that by and large, uh, our customers are, are relatively happy in terms of an industry. And this is specific to the industry and not to any particular airline. So by and large, three out of four packs are satisfied with their travel experience in general. However, obviously, we are striving to be more than that. So ultimately, where do we want to be as an industry by 2037, which is a metric which yet to be established. But of course, when we get into this, we really get into what's driving your satisfaction rates. So basically, looking at some really key points within the passenger journey to identify what's good and what needs to be improved. And as you can see, and it's not a big surprise, the airlines have invested a lot in payment solutions. The airlines have invested a lot in automation and check-in. Uh, as we, we, we've all experienced over the years. And we've also seen a real improvement in the booking process. So it's easier to book your flights and see so you get visibility on what's available out there. But some of the hard stats or some of the areas that we still see and need to improve upon, and they're pretty, pretty consistent uh, over the last number of years, really around security, which I, I ranted on a little bit uh, earlier today. Uh, border control and immigration, which uh, I was helped to be uh, reminded of some of the challenges that we have there in terms of, of uh, processing, and this is really all about queuing, stop the queuing. Uh, In-flight entertainment remains to be a, uh, a level of, uh, of or an area of opportunity. Uh, we've seen lots of work and strides made, but I think there's still a, a, a general desire to see, see that improve uh, even greater. And lastly, baggage collection. Again, another area that if you check a bag, uh, and if you do check a bag, you'll know exactly why it's frustrating, because the variability in that process is, uh, is extreme. And uh, as a result, I'll, I'll speak a little bit later about what the expectations are in terms of our customers and time, and you can see why they're dissatisfied. So when you, uh, when you look at set the, uh, oh, sure, I should have, should have, should have uh, so this is just the illustration of what I just I just said. So you can see uh, the percentages of of, uh, of satisfaction, and then the areas that I mentioned where they are just simply not satisfied. So when we take that, we do, we boil it into you know five distinct areas that, that the passengers have to, have de determined for us are the priorities. And I'll speak a little bit about what's happening or what their uh, their top items are in respect to innovation. A seamless journey to help facilitate that. Uh, what we need to do with baggage uh, disruption management, which is really uh, when flights are cancelled or delayed, and then passengers just with disabilities, which uh, a group will speak about uh, after uh, after me. So, in terms of innovation, uh, we're seeing we're seeing a, a gravitation towards uh, the desire to use a mobile phone more. So at one, at one time, online check-in was, was the answer. So using, using your computer, home computer, PC, or laptop to check-in. 
more and more now that is becoming a desire to be able to do that on your phone. So 51% of our customers want to do this via the smartphone. And uh, slowly but surely this is being uh, rolled out across, uh, across our network. As you can see the penetration in North Asia, 65% uh, uh, versus uh, other parts of the world where we still have uh, a, a sort of a mixed bag in terms of what the preference is in terms of checking. But obviously this is an area that we'll continue to see our airlines and the industry invest in. And sort of in line with that is the use of apps. So um, again, not surprising that this is becoming more and more prevalent as apps become more and more prevalent. So um, the opportunity for, uh, for our industry to be able to utilize these apps, as an example here, uh, almost uh, one third of our customers are prepared to utilize their app uh, to upgrade, to purchase lounge access, uh, to purchase uh, additional bags. So there's a general desire to utilize these apps for, for greater, uh, greater uh, autonomy and greater reasons. And also from a communication standpoint, uh, our customers want the app to be the, uh, the source and less SMS, uh, which again sort of makes sense as we all uh, have apps on our phone and find it a little bit more convenient than getting text messages uh, and the likes. And that is growing year over year and we expect that trend to continue uh, so we can anticipate that things will be done, uh, will, uh, you'll see greater investment and utilization of apps as we move forward. There you go. Alright, biometrics, which I again mentioned earlier this morning, uh, 46 slightly growth year over year, 46% of passengers would prefer to use biometric ID instead of passport for the journey. Not a big surprise as this is becoming more and more uh, prevalent to get away from paper. Um, around 34% incidentally in that survey would, would, would have a preference of using the paper passport. And uh, if you dig into the detail even further, some of that rationale is simply because they like the stickers, the stamps. Uh, and, uh, and so and obviously it's something you need to be cognizant of as we make change into the future. And 20% had no preference at all. So clearly we could swing that one way or the other with that 20% and easily biometric uh, penetration could be, uh, could be much higher. Um, so this leads us uh, and has resulted in us speaking more about the use of biometrics like we did this morning and I'll uh, touch on with the One ID program uh, in a few minutes. So uh, in terms of innovation, uh, the survey also indicated that uh, e-gates, uh, which I had a question on earlier when we talked about uh, the, uh, the way the checkpoints are managed, uh, the survey found that the vast majority of our customers are satisfied with this implementation. And if you haven't, and I, would have made, I would imagine the majority of us probably have experienced it, uh, it's faster. It's uh, intuitive and it enhances security. And those are all the reasons which led to why our customers are saying yes to this and more of it. And we talk about seamless journey. This is really, really about time. And it's really about fric. You know, we 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 use the word frictionless, but that's that's really what what it all boils down to. And these are areas that we are very, very, very familiar with. Um, and when I talk about expectations, you can see, you know, 80% of our customers in terms of time expect to drop, drop a bag off in less than three minutes. Um, the variability in that, as we know, for those that do check a bag, is, is very, uh, very inconsistent. And it's obviously an area that uh, we need to continue to focus on. We're getting better, uh, but still, there is, uh, there is much work to be done. When you talk about immigration and customs, the belief is, uh, or that our customers are telling us, around 80%, that less than 10 minutes is enough. And uh, I guess uh, most of us in this room would understand or and agree that the variability there, depending on the location in the country and the, and the time of day, etc., is vastly different and something that we need to strive towards. And even worse, or even better, more of an opportunity, one in four, I uh, think, is less than five minutes. So we are really uh, under delivering in terms of what our customers' expectations are in, the, uh, in terms of a seamless journey. And the last point, probably the one that is, uh, it has, has been there and is in need 
of, uh, of a rethink is on terms of baggage collection. Um, when you think about the time it takes you to deplane, the, takes you to, the time it takes you to walk in these big buildings to get to the baggage carousel and still have to wait for 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 minutes to get your bag is not a, an acceptable uh, situation to be in. Some airlines and some airports are much better at it than others, but clearly there's an opportunity here and our customers are reminding us year after year that this is an area that we need to focus on and pay, pay, put more, more attention to. As well in terms of uh, the seamless journey, boarding. And we've seen the variation between zones, between front and back, aisle, window to aisle, uh, free boarding, we've seen every airline out there has many ways of doing it, but we still see significant issues and opportunity here. And our customers themselves create some of these problems as well, because the minute you get, and I, and I don't know, uh, maybe I'm a bit of a junkie, but I often get to a gate early just to watch people's behavior. And you can see it. It's everybody sitting. If you're there an hour before, and you should do it if you've got time. Sit there an hour before departure and monitor the activity around the gate. And the closer you get to departure time, the closer everybody gets to the gate. It doesn't matter if you're in zone five or if you're using Wilma and you're in row 50. Everybody is queuing and queuing and getting closer to the agent and closer to the agent because the anticipation to get on board the airplane is, is there. And the aggravation goes up and all those other things that create the problems that we have today. And the other issue it's identified in here with almost half is the availability of onboard luggage space. And that's driving a lot of this behavior. Because I mean, what else do you want to get on an airplane for? <laughs> Certainly can't be for the seats, right? But it, uh, it's ultimately to find a spot for your bag. And we're all do it. we all do it. It's okay, we're all taking more and more stuff on board an airplane. But the, the, the interesting part, and, I, and on the previous slide, in terms of baggage handling, and I'll mention it again on another slide, Customers, if we handle this better, are more interested in would actually check more bags. So we have to find that sweet spot between being able to handle baggage better to allow for our customers to have the confidence to check them in in the first place so that we can start to deal with some of these problems. But efficient queuing, 60%, yes, please fix this, fix this, please. 51%, uh, uh, we don't like the buses in terminals. Unfortunately, I think that is here to stay. Uh, we only have one airport built as an example in Europe, and that's the first one in a decade, and that's in Poland. Uh, so we're not going to be building any airports anytime uh, in the near future that's going to be able to address this issue, but maybe we can find ways to be able to deal with it better uh, and, uh, and handle it uh, better than we do today. And then obviously, as I mentioned, the overhead bin space, which is a growing concern and an ongoing issue, consistent across the world. Baggage handling. This, this again, is a uh, there year after year, um, and it's the lowest performing area in our survey in terms of uh, needing the greatest amount of attention. And in the next slide, you'll see why. Fifty-three percent of our customers, one or two, would be more likely to check their bag if we tracked it. Dead stop. Uh, almost half would want their bag delivered directly to the final destination if we could. So they don't even want to see it. Half, half are prepared to pick it up at my house and drop it off wherever I'm going. But why can't we figure this out? We have attempted in a resolution at 753 to get the industry in the right direction in terms of tracking baggage. And some airlines are really, really good at it and really, really get it. Uh, I'd say probably the best example of that, not to, uh, or as my father would say, the best looking pup in an ugly litter is Delta. And Delta tracked their bags. But Delta is only good as if they partner with somebody else that doesn't track the bag and they're only allowing for part of that journey for it to be able to, uh, to deliver on the customer's expectation. Tracking baggage is a, is a, is a necessity. We've, we, we have an AGM resolution from last June 
which asks and encourages all airlines and airports to work together to implement some sort of baggage tracking. We have suggested, suggested RFID, but we're, we're agnostic to the technological solution that we would use. However, we are still a long way away from getting to the promised land in terms of tracking our baggage to deliver on our customer expectations. But the benefits of that are immense. Uh, we charge for this commodity. We can deal with the biggest issue that our customers are asking for. We can get the bags delivered sooner. We can unlock all kinds of opportunities in being able to, dis to disassociate a customer from their bag, deliver to where they want, create all kinds of uh, additional uh, uh, um, revenue from it. It's, it's in need of uh, greater attention and it is something that we, uh, as an industry, will continue to work on. Another area where uh, our sins are born quite frequently is on disruption management. We're a great industry when it's sky clear and we don't have any mechanical issues and we don't have aircraft shortages and we don't have airplanes that are grounded for various reasons. Uh, but when the uh, proverbial poop hits the fan, we kind of lose it a bit. And that's not, not, uh, not a surprise when you think that our load factors are as high as they are. So our ability to protect our customers are limited. Uh, our utilization of our aircraft are higher than it's ever been before. The saturation of our airports is at a level that it's never been before. So as a result, this should not surprise that we have an area of opportunity in terms of disruption management. But the things that our customers are asking for are very, very basic. Real-time, accurate travel information. Okay, so I travel a lot. I'm lucky. I consider it fortunate. Sometimes I'd rather travel less. However, when you think about it, I have at least three sources, sometimes more, that send me information about a delay, a gate change, an aircraft change, and not all of them are the same. There is no real trusted source, and as a result, our customers are confused. But we need to address this in terms of being able to make sure that the information that our customers are getting is accurate and, and, and on time. And if we do that, we solve a lot of angst and a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of concern when you're on your journey. Because most times, all they want to know is, what's, what are you going to do to me? And we can deal with it after that. And the other, the other big area that they're asking us to place more attention on is automatic rebooking. Um, call centers are not what they used to be, and uh, we're not the only industry that has the wait times and the callback functions, but asking customers to sit on the phone for four or five hours uh, is just not acceptable nowadays, and we have an opportunity to automate this, this particular area. And again, some airlines are leading here, and some are still, uh, still have a lot of work to do in terms of, just rebook me. Uh, why, do you, why do I need to, to speak to anybody? So, okay, one ID. Okay, so that's sort of, in a nutshell, where our uh, customers' frustrations or areas of opportunity uh, exist. Some of them are very simple and some of them are a lot more complex than we uh, and recognizing again that by and large our customers are happy. But we need to fix, uh, we need to fix a few things and our program as mentioned is uh, derived to do that. So one particular uh, program that we are working on with industry is, uh, is called One ID. You may have, uh, have already heard about this uh, and this really is about using the biometric uh, uh, a biometric to enable for our customers to be able to move through the process much more seamlessly than they do today, and I touched on it a little bit earlier. But I have a quick video to, uh, to show you what we mean. Press again. In order for future generations to fly sustainably, we need to rethink all sections of the industry itself. This means developing infrastructure and new processes that can cope with future demand without relying on ever bigger airports. More than anything, it means putting passengers at the heart of the decision-making process and providing them with a truly seamless, more efficient and secure experience. 
With passengers' consent, IATA's one ID allows for a paperless airport experience using a single, secure, biometric travel token, such as face, fingerprint, or iris scan for all travel processes, validating their identities throughout their journey. As a passenger, sharing your digital identity ahead of the journey will allow you to be biometrically recognized as you arrive at the airport and drop off your luggage. No more passport or boarding pass. No more hassle. You would then pass security and border control very quickly and board using the same simple process, experiencing reduced queues and waiting times and allowing you to relax and enjoy your journey. Upon arrival, you will be able to enjoy the same seamless experience. One ID will better protect your privacy and data, allowing only authorised stakeholders to access your information only on a need-to-know basis. This highly efficient and innovative process improves traveller satisfaction, provides enhanced security and increases capacity within existing infrastructure. In order to make this vision a reality, we need to agree on global standards for a digital identity that can be trusted and recognised by the industry and governments. Together, we can make air travel safer, more efficient, secure and sustainable. It's, it's nothing new. Uh, we've, as I mentioned, we've, we've been uh, pushing very hard on, on this particular item because we know the benefits. It's, it is utopia when we get there, but the uh, the opportunity and the technology exists today, and now it's just a matter of making sure that we get those standards in place. And the framework is very simple. It's the, the digital identity linked to your passenger name records or your API information or passport that would be determined, uh, designed by privacy, so making sure that uh, uh, that the, the data that is being utilized is private and managed accordingly, which we have many examples of today, passport being one of them, and that it's interoperable. And interoperable basically means that it's not specific to one airport or one airline, but it would actually be utilized through the entire passenger journey to avoid being uh, a difference or different between one airport and another or one airline or another. And in terms of the work and where we are today uh, and how this is emerging, last slide, uh, we have countless examples of where, uh, where, where this is being trialed uh, and, and, and we are involved in, in the majority of them. Understanding the benefits of those, and we have one example uh, in, uh, in terms of passenger boarding, which Lufthansa brings up quite frequently, um, the use of biometrics to board an aircraft Forget the wide body, I believe it was a 777 out of Los Angeles that they were able to cut the boarding time in half by utilizing uh, biometrics as the, as the means versus the traditional means of scanning uh, a 3D barcode. Uh, so that, that's a, a significant benefit, but just one small illustration. But as I mentioned, these, are, these uh, different models are emerging. But at the end of the day, all these different models, uh, the real crux of it is the government need to take control of the process. This, this, this is really where, where it resides, uh, and we are working with them to make sure that we understand where that uh, and create an environment where that is the case. But uh, it's coming. Uh, it's just a question of when. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, we've gone over our time slightly, so we've got a few minutes for questions if anybody's got a question.